It's Tuesday, it's 12.15 and we're live in Westminster. Joining me, Conservative MP Mark Harper, Labour MP Clive Lewis, Guardian North of England editor Helen Pidd and GB News presenter Inaya Falarin Iman. Today, how much did these photos of Boris Johnson matter? Unless you're going to say that the Prime Minister is not telling the truth and the Met Police aren't telling the truth, it wasn't a party. Boris Johnson's focus is on his own political survival, not the financial survival of people across the country. The Prime Minister's trying to focus on the economy today, but can he hope to draw a line under Partygate? Congratulations to you all for being the first house missed our brand new Elizabeth Line service. Is this new rail line good just for London or the country? Is the Sinn Féin leadership right to say this about post-Brexit trade rules in Northern Ireland? The majority of people who've been returned, who've been elected, are actually for the protocol. The protocol is working. All the business surveys will point to that. And should an MP have used this word when talking about Britain? I feel we are sleepwalking closer and closer to the F word. When I say the F word, I'm talking about fascism. Let's start with the images that you saw briefly in the headlines of Boris Johnson attending a lockdown event at number 10, for which he hasn't received a fine. We'll show you those images in more detail in just a moment. But let's listen to what Grant Shapps, member of the Cabinet, said in defence. I imagine from the Prime Minister's point of view, what happened was he was asked to go down and thank somebody who was leaving, walks in, raises a glass, thanks them and leaves. And I imagine that's the reason why. But I don't seek to second-guess... Uh, the police work, the Met police work, in the same way as I don't seek to second-guess or influence the work of the Durham police who are investigating, of course, the leader of the opposition and the deputy leader of the opposition right now. Mark Harper, you called for the Prime Minister to resign in April. Uh, what did you think when you saw those images? Well, I'm afraid the images that we saw, I think, just support the decision that I reached um, the letter that I wrote to Sir Graham Brady and what I said to the Prime Minister's face in the House of Commons. He broke the rules. That event, uh, I understand there's at least one person at that event that has been fined for attending. So we it understand was an that too. gathering. Um, and the Prime Minister, however long he was at it, should have sent everyone home. But the thing is, he, it, it's not just the events, it's the fact that he's not been straightforward about it. I mean, you were on television on, on Sunday, Joe. You couldn't get a straight answer out of a cabinet minister about whether he, a meeting happened and who called a meeting between the Prime Minister and Sue Gray. They're not being straight about it and I, you know, I'm fed up, and I said this in the House of Commons, with my colleagues, a number of decent men and women who are being asked to go out on the television day after day and saying things that are frankly ridiculous and defending the indefensible. That's not what a leader should do. When the Prime Minister gets asked about these things on television, he says he can't talk about them until Sue Gray comes out. And yet ministers are sent out every day to frankly have to just defend things that are, as I said, aren't defensible. And not being straight with people is a real problem. Um, and that's why I said to the Prime Minister that I felt he wasn't worthy of his office and he should go. And I have said that when he'd been found guilty of breaking the law and I felt not being straight with people, and I stick to that view, and I think everything that's happened since um, supports it. My colleagues this week, when Sue Gray's report's published, we think tomorrow, mm. are going to have to make their decision about whether they're prepared to go along with it or not. Helen, how powerful are these pictures, um, the visual impact for you? Because um, there are certainly people that sat in the studio that say everything is priced in, there isn't anything else that we need to know, uh, we've made up our minds. Or do you think the images change things? I don't think they really change things. I mean, on a personal level, I thought I was getting bored of Partygate, wanted everything to move on. And then and yet another re revelation comes out and I feel cross all over again. But I think the nation has basically made up its mind. There are those who think it's a storm in a teacup 
we've got bigger things to worry about. And then there's a substantial, I think the majority of people actually, who think that it was wrong. And, you know, when I travel around um, around the north of England and, and, and beyond talking to people, it does feel like there's been a shift and any grievance that people have. For example, I was at, um, at a, a, an emergency dental clinic for people who couldn't get NHS appointments uh, last week. Mm. And people were saying in the queue, well, if they weren't busy having so many parties, maybe they could sort out dental care. And you can, you know, you could insert any other grievance uh, for dental care there. So I think it's caused immense damage to the Conservative Party, but I don't think this one picture will change anybody's mind. In our do you all remember those videos a few months ago when you had ministers coming out saying that you know they're sure that there wasn't a party but even if there was Boris Johnson wasn't there and now you know as the months have transpired it does look quite frankly ridiculous I think I was one of those people that in the beginning was you know genuinely mortified that there was this sense that there was one rule for them and, and one rule for everybody else but I do worry that the continuation of this and unless there is some kind of resolution that we are going to overlook much more difficult questions so for example this is almost most functioning as a way to avoid difficult questions about the lockdown. Was the lockdown too far? You know, questions about care homes, also whether or not we should have closed schools. And now we are in a cost of living crisis where many of our political leaders fail to have any ideas, vision or policies to be able to deal with some of these very difficult issues that people are facing right now. So I hope that in the next few weeks when we actually have some kind of resolution about what's going on, but I just think that it is continuing too long now. Clive, can I get you to um, look at the two images side by side here? You can see uh, Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, holding a beer bottle at a campaign event um, next to one of those images of Boris Johnson, as the government says, briefly walking into this leaving event uh, before departing to work. Do you think the public will see any difference between the two? Um, well, apart from the the fact that the one with the Prime Minister looked like a kind of reenactment from the Buddington Club days. Um, yeah, I think they will. Look, I think Keir Starmer has not only put himself on the line, he's uh, offered to resign if he is found in breach of those rules, but mm. the rules are quite clear. It was illegal to participate in a gathering if that gathering was not reasonably necessary for work. And Keir Starmer has made, I think, a convincing case that he was a part of a work, part of a work process. I think... Um, the public can see with Boris Johnson the fact that he has lied to Parliament, he has lied to the British public. Um, Although the Met Police, of well, course, have decided that he shouldn't be fine because they believed the idea that he was at work and attending a work-related event. This, this comes back, and, and th th these issues are linked, this comes back to who wields power in this country, accountability and transparency. And at that moment, mm. we have what we call the, the good chaps theory of government. Basically, that people, that's, you know, that's, this is Peter Hennessy, mm. this theory yeah. that people, uh, politicians are good people, inherently decent, mm. and they will mm. do the right thing. Mm. Well, that's being, a, a coach and horses are being driven through that. And it links the two sides, both where our money is spent, the cost of living crisis, and mm. our democracy about how the decisions mm. are made. And at the moment, you know, what Boris Johnson's doing, he is the boss. He isn't going to fire himself. He isn't going to hold himself accountable. And the Met Police aren't going to hold him accountable because he has power. Right. Well, on the Met Police, um, there are questions, it seems, uh, for the police force today. Um, some of it coming from the Mayor of London, uh, Sadiq Khan. Let's have a listen. I've, uh, you know, not asked questions about this. I've kept away from this. But I think it's important when it comes to uh, trust and confidence, when it comes to policing by consent, when it comes to questions being asked about the integrity of an investigation, that the police explain why they've reached the conclusions uh, they have. Um, Vicky, just explain why now there are questions and pressure on the Metropolitan Police about the fact that they haven't fined Boris Johnson for the images that we can see here at this event. Well, they haven't given any explanation. I mean, they haven't told us much at all, have they? I mean, no. We've pieced together these events, what happened, who might have been there, and then had to try and piece together why fines were given to someone or other. So they have not explained their thinking about all of this. So it does leave us trying to work it out. So the Prime Minister got fined for the famous birthday cake that never got out the tin, but, mm. you know, he was in the Cabinet room. And yet we know that the Cabinet Secretary, Simon Case, was also there, but didn't get a fine. And we don't know why. Um, now, that one, we know that the Prime Minister's wife was there, for example. Mm. So that made it a different kind of event, you could argue, because there was an outsider there. This one, this particular one here, which was on um, the day of the 13th of November, again, he went along. <clears throat> um, 
the only sort of understanding we have about all of this is that if you were, as you said, reasonably necessary for you to be there, so maybe if you worked in the press office and you were having a drink, you know, the rules didn't say what you could eat or drink once you were at work, but then what if someone else joined from another office or another part of the building? Mm. Maybe that's why they were fined. Or the party went on for longer. But, of course, none of that was explained or written down. None of it's been explained to us since. So it makes it incredibly difficult for us to work out why. And it's difficult for Boris Johnson and the situation he's found himself in because of what he said in the House of Commons in response to a question from a Labour MP. Yeah, now again, this is about the 13th of November. Now, we know from the Metropolitan Police that they looked at two events that day. One was uh, a leaving do gathering party, whatever you want to call it, for Lee Kane, the outgoing director of communications, and the other was an alleged party in the flat belonging to or you know where Boris Johnson lives with his wife so they looked at both of those uh, but in on the 8th of December this is what a Labour MP asked Boris Johnson in the House of Commons. Will the Prime Minister tell the House whether there was a party in Downing Street on the 13th of November? Prime Minister Mr. Speaker, no, but I'm sure that it, and it, whatever happened, uh, the guidance was followed and the rules were followed at all times. So the question there mm. is, and some people are saying, well, this comes down to your definition of a party. Um, but that wasn't actually what was in law. It was about gathering indoors. It was two or more people. Uh, and again, it's what is reasonably necessary for work. I mean, I think most people wouldn't have thought that, you know, having leaving drinks was reasonably exactly. necessary. But, I mean, reasonably necessary is a bit subjective, isn't yes, it? Yes, well, you and can I think interpret, I suppose, these things That is the problem different. that they've got. The Prime Minister, I think, would say, uh, and I said this all along, that it... I think he said at one point it didn't occur to him that these kind of things would be against the rules, that they were deemed to be parties. Um, again, I think at the time, and we all remember what we were doing and thinking and what other people were, which was saying, I'm going round to see a friend. If I go to their garden, can I use their loo? I mean, that was the kind of thing people were thinking about. Clearly, those discussions were not being had in Downing Street by most people in there. Uh, Vicky has said there is some interpretation that is open as to what might be reasonable in terms of work, an extension of work or even an extension of home. Um, the Prime Minister faces an investigation uh, marked by the Commons Privileges Committee about whether he misled Parliament. Do you think he deliberately misled Parliament? Look, for me, this is quite straightforward. He set rules that he asked the country to follow. He should have been the person who most exactly followed them to set an example. If you're a minister, you have to hold yourself to higher standards, not lower standards. And it's very clear to me that the guidance and the rules were not followed. And if there'd been any doubt, he should have been the exemplar. And the other thing is he should be straight about it. And the reason why I said he should go was because I concluded both for the fact that he'd broken the law himself, which he's accepted, and the fact that we saw, we now know there were 83 people fined 126 times in Downing Street, the most you know, COVID law-breaking, mm. rule-breaking centre. Yeah. It's not credible that on all the occasions when he said all the rules were followed and nothing was untoward, mm. I just don't think it's credible that he was being straight with people. And so it's two things. It's, did you follow the rules and have you been straight with people? Oh. And the conclusion I've come to is he hasn't been, which is why I regretfully think he should have resigned as Prime Minister. Mark Harper has always been clear, uh, well, certainly in recent months, about his view of the Prime Minister as set out. Is Mark in a minority amongst Conservative MPs? We know of a handful, certainly publicly, who have said that the Prime Minister should go and who have sent in letters um, of no confidence. But, but what's the scale within the party? Because they are the ones in the end who, and the only ones really at this point in time, who can actually force a leadership contest. There's certainly more than a handful that are very unhappy with the leadership. Mm. Now, the question of letters, of course, we never know about no. all of that. Uh, I think there is an element of, yes, these images obviously make it more stark, but we did know about all of this before. He has, as you say, already been fined and accepted that, so has accepted he's broken the law and the Cabinet didn't move against him and Tory MPs didn't move against him. So the question is, is there going to be anything else which means that they decide to do that? I'm not sure uh, that there will be, uh, at this point, 
Um, but they will be making a decision about integrity in public life, mm. about leadership mm. and what they are willing to accept. And I think, as you've said before, cabinet ministers having to come out and defend all of this mm. is looking increasingly uncomfortable. And I think this week, if Sue Gray's report does come out as we expect, it will be uh, even harder to do that. But I, I do think a lot of them have probably made up their mind. And to be frank with you, a lot of them are saying, well, I don't know who else we'd have. And that is actually what's well, keeping well, that's, him in his well, place. Well, the thing is... Well, there are bigger issues and, and well, move on. Two things. Many of my colleagues <clears throat> have said to their constituents that they were waiting for the process to finish. The police have finished. Yes. As of tomorrow, Sue Gray's report's out. So those colleagues then have... They've got to make a decision, right? And the question for them is, do they want to go into an election, general election, with mm. the Prime Minister leading us, so that we're all put in the position that those Cabinet Ministers uh, are being put into? And that is the question they've got to face. Yes. They're going to have to do, make their minds up. Well, the other up question is, who, who would replace him? Who would you like to replace well, look, him? I don't know, and, but the point is we've got a very good process. It's Conservative members of Parliament who will question our colleagues and put them through that process. Right. I have total confidence that we've got great people in the party, we'll have a process, we'll test them and we'll end up with someone who can lead us to victory. It's because I think we can win the next election mm -hmm. and the Conservative Party has so much more to offer the country, right. but I want us to go into it with a new leader so that we can win and it matters. The Conservative Party is more important than whoever leads it today. All right, Vicky Young, thank you very much. I know you're desperate to come in briefly. Clive. I just think the fact that it comes down to whether ministers feel that they can come out and defend something, that our constitutional situation is such, <clears throat> it's, just, it's, it's, just, it's just not acceptable. And it goes to the very heart, the fact that we're still talking about this months after mm. we know it happened goes, we should be asking questions about our constitution and how this can happen. Um, and that Boris Johnson and someone like him can be allowed to get away with it. All right, we're going to talk about the uh, long delayed and long awaited um, Elizabeth line. Uh, once again, it's the uh, Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, who's been talking about this. Let's show uh, you his tweet. Today's the day. The Elizabeth line opens. This is a big moment for London and the entire country. Get ready for modern trains, step-free stations and reduced journey times across the capital and the south-east. You can't sound more upbeat than that. Is it going to be a big moment, Helen, for the entire country from where you are in Manchester? <laughs> yeah, I laughed when I saw that tweet. Um, no, I mean, forgive me for sounding a little bit bitter, but, you know, when Berkshire and Buckinghamshire are the ones being levelled up with this investment, it is hard to celebrate, um, particularly when I'm reliant on still, still slow services in the north of England um, and, and a, nor a northern rail service, which at the moment it's, its solution to its woeful service is just to cut trains and cut services so that not so many of them are late. Um, and I just think that there's it's particularly um, galling in the context of what the government has decided to do in terms of rail investment in the north of England. It's cut the eastern leg of HS2 and it has agreed to a bargain basement version of Northern Powerhouse Rail, which would have been this transformational east-west line across the Pennines. They've gone for a, a really cheap version, uh, which will not uh, even stop at Bradford. And if they're serious about levelling up, then they need a proper train service to Bradford, which is um, England, Britain's actually youngest city. Um, so yeah, forgive my bitterness, but it doesn't feel like a big moment for the entire country. Well, we'll forgive you uh, for once, um, Helen, for that. Um, in our, do you agree with Helen that um, Actually, it's not a big moment for the country, despite Sadiq Khan saying it is, actually, well, certainly for the southeast of England, but he says for the whole country. I mean, I partly agree with Helen. I mean, I, I'm quite cautious and, and sceptical of this kind of false dichotomy between London and the rest of the UK. I mean, London is the capital city. It's also a global city, and we would want it to be innovative, um, strong investment in infrastructure and world-beating when it comes to the transport system. So I'm very positive when we see expansions of it. And I'm not sure Sadiq Khan necessarily, when you look at... Um, TfL as a whole has been particularly successful on that. But I totally agree with Helen when it comes to the lack of infrastructure and dealing with questions of regional inequality that was promised in the run-up to Brexit. I mean, that was quite a fundamental argument in relation to post-industrial communities in particular um, being deprived and not having the investment they needed to level up. And we've seen years down the line... Minister for Brexit Opportunities, Minister for Leveling Up, there's mm. been a complete dearth of ideas and policies in relation to dealing with this. And this has been a particular theme over the last few years of this government, promises in relation to actually improving people's material lives, but failing to actually meet the expectations that they've raised of everybody else. Well, just to underline some of the points that Inaya has been uh, talking about, the regional transport spending, um, this is from the IPPR, per head, you can see very clearly there, uh, London, 
England, £906 uh, per head. Let's take your uh, region, east of England, £484. Um, and... that, that, that'll be roads. I mean, this is the thing, you know, London gets rail and, and good, and it's not the fault of London commuters um, that this government has failed over the last 10, 10 years or so to invest in transport infrastructure in the way that it should compared to say Germany has yeah, just but increased you, but, but, but anyway, do you welcome you, the but you welcome the rail line I mean do you agree I, with Sadiq Khan it's, it's going to create it think, hundreds of thousands of new jobs and homes across the southeast and estimated 42 billion pounds to I, the UK economy I think a, a, you know a, it's a public mass transit system which is going to help us decarbonize transport in the city is great but it isn't shouldn't be a zero sum game we should be able to do that in London yes it's the biggest city in the country in arguably in most of the world and we should also be able to invest in the rest of the country and you know you've got a 22 billion pound budget for road building why not you know why rather than spending on that which is going to be emitting greenhouse gases it's 20th century technology why not be spending more on rail infrastructure across the country on bus routes on public infrastructure in cities and towns across our countries that's what we should be doing and we shouldn't be looking enviously mm. uh, at, at what's happening in london we should be spending that money elsewhere to get us fit match fit for the 21st century well, the whole point about levelling up is you don't make other regions better off by, by doing down London. And I'd look, in my region, in the South West, for example, um, we, the government's just signed off some big infrastructure projects on improving the A417 and the A303, which are used by enormous numbers of people, and that's very welcome. They're big investments. Um, I do want to see more of that, but these things are very long-term. So, I mean, this, this project mm. was kicked off under Labour. We had a big decision to make after the financial crash, and George Osborne, I think, should get a lot of credit for having having continued to go ahead with it, even when it would have been easy to cancel it. They have very long-term um, uh, timeline. So I do want to see more infrastructure investment across the country. Um, but you, you, I want to see the, the other regions go up rather than London rather than London go down. This will benefit uh, the whole country. It's worth remembering. Will it, how, so, how will it well, help the whole country? 60, You've heard what Helen said. Well, nearly 60% of the contracts for work, so whether it's the building, whether it's the trains and so forth, have, been, have gone to businesses across Great Britain outside London. So, you know, oh. some of these big infrastructure projects, they benefit people all over. HS2, for example, some contracts for that are directly employing people in my constituency in the Forest of Dean. That's good for everybody. Well, just to, to give you an idea of how long this has taken, this project, it was the first story I ever covered as a, a, as a broadcast journalist. Anyway, Helen, responding to the fact that it is benefiting the country because of the contracts. I mean, I take his point that there has been kind of capital investment, I suppose, and there are firms around the country. But I just think there's minimal evidence that London's wealth is fairly redistributed. And London has already got a transport system which knocks the rest of the countries into a into a popped hat. I was looking at the Elizabeth line before. So Reading is one of the stops. Even before mm. that line was built, you can get to London in 25 minutes. It's a 40 mile journey. That is slightly further than Manchester to Bradford. And the fastest train between Manchester and Bradford at the moment takes an hour. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think it's just yet, yet more London benefiting, even though, like Clive, I applaud anything really that gets people out of their cars and it's a sort of progressive move. It just feels unfair when the government has chosen not to give the North what the North has asked for. All right, well, let's talk about politics in Northern Ireland because politicians from Sinn <clears throat> Féin, which is now the largest party in the Northern Ireland Assembly after the elections earlier this month, they're in London today for meetings with their UK counterparts. The Northern Ireland executive the power-sharing government is still not in place because the DUP is saying they won't join it until there are changes to the Northern Ireland Protocol. Those pictures you just saw there are uh, Sinn Féin politicians celebrating. Um, and, of course, the Northern Ireland Protocol is a key part of the UK government's Brexit deal. Let's welcome uh, Connor Murphy, Finance Minister and Sinn Féin member of the Northern Ireland Assembly. Um, Connor, who are you meeting and what's your message? Well, we've been meeting the... Uh foreign embassies last night. We spoke to the Foreign Press Association this morning. We're meeting a range of people uh, from across all of the parties this afternoon and then we're doing a, a briefing uh, tonight in the House of Commons uh, with invited guests. Our message is very clear that the protocol is there to stay. Uh, Boris Johnson accepted that on his visit to Belfast last week. He talked about trying to fix mm. the protocol rather than replace it. Uh, we're up for smoothing the arrangements of the protocol. I think all of the parties are. But the majority of parties that are elected to the Assembly in this Assembly a couple of weeks ago and in the last Assembly support the protocol remaining in place. They want to see it work properly uh, and they want to see the advantages that it gives uh, the North of Ireland uh, in fully exploited and, and, and business being able to take advantage of the unique position that we have. Do you accept that there are serious problems with the Northern Ireland Protocol? 
Uh, no, I don't accept there are serious problems. I think there are problems. But there are problems. There are, of course. I mean, we've changed okay. trading arrangements. The people of, of the north of Ireland voted to remain in Europe because we recognised that Brexit was a bad idea for Ireland and that it would have negative impacts. We were taken out against our consent uh, out of Europe. Uh, so the protocol was an arrangement put in place to try and undo the damage that Brexit was going to undoubtedly cause the island of Ireland. Uh, and of course, any change in trading arrangements will, will create additional paperwork and additional problems. Those issues need to be smoothed over. In our view, talking to the European Commission, they are ready to put proposals on the table to assist in removing some of the barriers that are there. And that should happen, but they you, need a good faith negotiation with Boris well, we'll Johnson's come on, government. Absolutely, we'll come on to today. the good faith negotiation. I think it is the level of severity in terms of the burdensome nature of the checks and the bureaucracy that is being experienced by businesses and by people in Northern Ireland. Um, let's just take the chairman of Marks and Spencer, uh, who told the Today programme last week that the rules are highly bureaucratic and pretty pointless. He talked about hundreds of pages <coughs> of documents, partly written in Latin, <coughs> and a particular typeface being required. Do you accept there is a serious problem with the way the EU is imposing its rules? Well, the chairman of Marks and also said that they had difficulty uh, providing food on shelves in Northern Ireland and that their sandwiches they couldn't uh, get, get arranged. The sandwiches are actually made in my constituency, so they don't have to travel across the Irish Sea. They're made in Uri, uh, and that there is no shortage of foods on the shelves. So I think he should be more informed, perhaps, by some of his stores and but this store is the, But this is their experience. This well, is their experience of obviously well, trading yeah. under, as you say, new arrangements, which the British, which everybody, government, agreed. Uh, which the yeah. British government agreed, but it is about interpretation. You've mm. accepted there are problems. You don't think they're serious, but you've accepted that there are yeah, problems and course. they need to be changed. So you are open to those changes. We're open to improving the, the working of the protocol, but the basic uh, requirement is mm that we need to ensure that the Good Friday Agreement, that economic prosperity on the island of Ireland is not damaged by the Brexit arrangements that the British government foisted on us. Mm. And the protocol was the mechanism that was put in place to try and undo some of that. Can it be improved? Of course it can be improved. But the argument from those within unionism, and w one which has been encouraged by people within the right of the Tory party, that oh. it can be done away with, is not uh, uh, on the table at all. Right. Is that you? Uh, is Conor Murphy talking about you? I mean, this idea of unilateral well, action look, and scrapping well, the look, protocol. Two things. There, there are clearly issues, and, it, and it's welcome that they're, they're recognised. The, the thing about the communities in Northern Ireland, the, pro the problem is the Northern Ireland Protocol is not supported, I understand, by any... Uh, MLA that was elected from the unionist part of the community. And the Belfast Good Friday Agreement requires consent both from unionists and nationalists. And the east-west arrangements between Great Britain and Northern Ireland are just as important as the north-south um, arrangements between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. So there are clearly problems to be solved. The British government's um, preferred solution is to resolve them by uh, negotiation, but it has reserved the right, if those negotiations don't end up in the right place, to take unilateral action. And I, but, I mean, I, look, I hope that we can get a negotiated agreement between the United Kingdom government and the EU. That would be the best outcome, but the government wants to make sure we get an outcome that works and has reserved the right to, to do it unilaterally if required. Who negotiated this protocol? No, it was negotiated by, by, by the government, and it's about how it's been implemented. Um, look, one of the problems here, and this is one of the challenges, I want the executive to get back so that those ministers can be mm. forming the government. The problem we've got is there's a bit of a trust problem uh, now from the unionist side where, where they want to see things happen with the protocol before they're prepared to go back into the executive. And, and that's you know, regrettable but understandable. So I want this to make progress. I want to get the executive back up and running so that uh, politicians elected to it can make decisions for the people they represent. Can I just say in relation, I, I mean, I think the Conservative Party are trying to turn the Good Friday Agreement on its head. Uh, and that's frankly concerning for people who live in Ireland. Not a single nationalist elected member, or indeed alliance, consented to Brexit. But we were taken out of the uh, European Union against our wishes. That's the majority of MLAs who are in the Assembly. The Democratic Unionist Party have prevented the North-South arrangements operating since last October. That's now heading towards eight months. The British government didn't feel compelled to act on behalf well, of those of us... Sorry, to finish the point. Those of us who want to see the North-South and East-West arrangements, they never felt compelled to act in relation to that. Those, those arrangements have been blocked since last October. And we did not consent uh, to... Uh, the, the actual the, the protocol arrangements are indeed Brexit. Don't require the consent 
uh, under the Good Friday Agreements. The only thing that requires consent is a constitutional well, change in our position as to whether we remain in the UK or outside of it. So those consent arrangements are only now being quoted by the British government in an attempt to turn the Good Friday Agreement on its head. And that, frankly, is very alarming for people. And you say that you want to see an agreement. Of course, we want to see an agreement too. But the government has begun to act unilaterally, and that takes us off into very dangerous territory as far as our uh, politics in Ireland are concerned. Well, I think I'd just point out on, on the executive. Um, I think it's right to say that Sinn Féin stopped the executive coming into place for about three years in a dispute they were having actually. over the uh, Irish Language Act. So, well, hang on, you well, did. Well, well, no. let, yes, I'm, I'm going to just pick that. up, Connor. No, no, on I think on you're that. actually well, incorrect. Let, well, you can express. No, I will, because um, you know the DUP would argue, as Mark is is trying to um, to to say that actually you did uh, pull out of power sharing um, in the same way in 2017, um, oh, yeah. and that was over a rather botched heating scheme, actually, originally, as we understand it, with Arlene Foster. But you did pull out. It was a row over financial scandal, which would have brought down any coalition right. in the Western world where our partner in government <coughs> sure. was up to but its neck in a financial scandal. Out. Of course, we yeah, did. And we, you did. Uh, we did because we, at the time, uh, all of the MLAs, with the exception of the DUP, asked Arlene Foster mm -hmm. to step aside to allow an inquiry to take place. She refused to do that. Uh, we got an inquiry, we had an election, we put a deal on the table within a number of months, which the DUP leadership, including Arlene Foster, agreed to but their party wouldn't accept, and that took a further two years. So the DUP actually kept us out of office for the totality of the three years. Uh, but the, the, the issue which brought it down was not the Irish Language Act. The issue was a financial scandal the DUP were involved in, which would have ended any coalition arrangement that I'm aware of. Uh, but Northern Ireland was without an executive right. for over a 1,000 exactly, days. Exactly, let's so not the misinterpret how that No, and I said it was to do with the botched yeah. heating scheme, which was, as you say, a, a financial uh, scandal. Does the government, uh, Clive, have a right to change the protocol? Well, clearly, it thinks it does. Yeah. Well, do that you agree that they do because of the difficulties well, you, you, that... Well, this is the thing. If you sign an international treaty um, and claim to abide by the rule of international law, then, then <laughs> surely at some point you, you, you abide by that and you don't go around threatening unilateral uh, uh, action on that issue. So, look, whether it's a negotiating position or not, I don't think it's the kind of thing that a responsible government should be doing at a time when it's busy lambasting, quite rightly, countries like Russia for smashing up uh, international law and, 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 and starting wars. So, look, I think at the end of the day, what you see here in what's happening in Northern Ireland there are two things. I don't think the European Union will be half as uh, concerned about uh, border checks if we as a country were moving to increase and upgrade standards in this country. Instead, with the trade agreements that we have negotiated, they are looking at the standards on food, uh, on, other, on electrical goods and other things and thinking to themselves, well, we do need to protect our borders from the way that this country is negotiating its trade deals around the world and then lowering standards. And secondly, I think the Conservative Party will have to acknowledge that it has put rocket boosters on the breakup of the United Kingdom by its decisions on Brexit. There are consequences for Brexit. And the breakup of the United Kingdom was happening before Brexit now has rocket boosters. And I think that's something that they are going to have to come to terms with. And we're going to have to find right. some new constitutional settlements. In our well, you know, I think that when we talk about Brexit, we voted as a united kingdom. So I don't think it's right to say that particular parties didn't support Brexit or different parts or regions of the United Kingdom. It was a whole country vote. And then we negotiate that and deal with the consequences of that. I do think it is right to mention the fact that Boris Johnson did mention that the deal was oven ready. And actually what has transpired that is not the case. But we have been talking about sovereignty over the last few months and obviously the last few years as well with Brexit. And I do think that this is also a question of sovereignty. When you have... Um, an institution that is not um that doesn't have the democratic oversight that the UK government does have, effectively overseeing goods and services moving from different parts of the United Kingdom, and that is causing bureaucratic problems. That is something that um, should be that, that 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 is something that should be looked at. And whilst um, Boris Johnson did originally say that it was all fine, it's transpired that that's not the case. And so I think this technocratic and legalistic approach, which is just simply that you just, signed just, it, just quickly, that si simply that you signed it, and therefore it cannot be renegotiated. I just do not think yes, that's right. Really interesting concept that obviously it kind of got a lot of coverage during Brexit. Do you think that the UK Parliament is now sovereign? Well, look, I, I think that what when it comes to the Northern Ireland Protocol, the idea is that, for example, we should be able to make decisions over the well, future I can of, tell you now, of, of the future I can tell of you now, this country. Me and Mark and I, don't have sovereignty. Parliament doesn't have sovereignty. Boris Johnson has sovereignty. You see, we're subjects. 
The Queen has sovereignty, and she well, gives I mean, that sovereignty can, to and Boris and Johnson. That's why Boris Johnson and you're, and you're can't be fired debate. for lying to Parliament, and, and because and he has sovereignty. And, and you're, so, and you're you know, free this issue to, of sovereignty and you're, is well, a bit well, of a You are free to advocate for that question about the constitutional monarchy within the United Kingdom. That's not necessarily a significant debate now, but I would not stop people wanting to make that an issue, a political issue to be debated. So, But when it comes to Brexit, that was one element of sovereignty in relation to the United Kingdom. And this issue is challenging that, and I think it's right for Boris Johnson to ask questions. But just finally, mm. on the question of uh, removing parts of it or scrapping it, there is clearly elements of brinkmanship going on. So I do mm. think that part of it is a kind of tactic used in order to get people to the negotiating table. Mm. Helen? Well, I mean, I'm inclined to leave these three to it, to be honest. All right, I, I, <laughs> all right. I, I can grant you that if you, if you, would, if you would prefer it. <laughs> hey, well, I, I think what I, I mean, what I would say, and I'm no expert on Northern Ireland, is it just exposes the careless approach that the Tory party took to uh, to Northern Ireland and the fact that, that that now, you know, they're talking about essentially a referendum over the future of Northern Ireland and reunification in Ireland. And, um, yeah, I, th I think that's pretty unforgivable. Now, do, do you, what do you say to that? It was a careless approach. I mean, you know all the chatter and talk was about the fact that Boris Johnson and the government made a deal and they would think about the details later. No, look, I think it's important that we get this right. I'm a very strong unionist. I want Northern Ireland to remain in the United Kingdom. And I know, um, you know, the, the two ministers, the Secretary of State and, and, you know, Connor Burns, the Minister of State, have been working really hard, uh, both internationally and across both of the, the communities in Northern Ireland, to try and make this work. And I think getting a, a solution that works for the long term in the interests of both Great Britain and Northern Ireland is the best outcome and that, that's what I want to see us get to. Are you confident of that outcome? Uh, no, I'm not confident because I think the British government... There is a mechanism within the protocol arrangements to, to uh, alter them, to uh, make sure that there's a smooth implementation of the protocol. That's where this needs to be fixed. It won't be resolved in the executive in Belfast. It won't be resolved in the assembly in Belfast. And the DUP's denial uh, of that institution to even sit is only punishing the people who need us to take decisions in terms of cost of living crisis, trying to fix the health service and get more <coughs> money into it. It's simply punishing the people that we collectively represent uh, the negotiations around this are between the EU and the British government. There's a mechanism there to do it. It doesn't require the British government to act unilaterally and threaten to legislate and, and try and up the ante in this. They, they just need to get into good faith negotiations and allow us to get on with promoting uh, economic development on the island and trying to support people who need our help from the Assembly oh. and the Executive. Conor Murphy, thank you very much for coming to talk to us. Last week, uh, Myrie Black, the SNP MP for Paisley and Renfrewshire South, stood up in the House of Commons and delivered a speech. She posted that speech onto her Twitter account. Since then, it's been watched by 2.6 million people. Let's take a listen to some of it. And over the last 12 years, I fear we are sleepwalking closer and closer to the F word. And I know everyone is scared to say it for fear of sounding over the top or being accused of going too far. But I say this with all sincerity. When I say the F word, I'm talking about fascism. Wow. Fascism wrapped in red, white and blue. Uh, Clive, you were there. You called it a brilliant speech. By the way, we asked Mary Black uh, if she would join us, but she was unavailable. Uh, was she right to use the word fascism? I think what she was doing was trying to, uh, I think, get, quite rightly, the public's attention, your attention. I think mm. she's, it's worked in that sense. Mm. And what she... You know, look, if you're going to go for an academic definition, uh, then clearly this government is not, by an academic definition, a fascist government. You can, it's obvious, and to call it one would be wrong. However, what I think is happening is that we are building an infrastructure, a scaffolding, which has the potential in the future to go in a very dark direction. And I think fascism is one word you could use. If you think about the Nationalities and Borders Act, the attacks on the Human Rights Act, which are now in the Queen's speech, mm. you've got uh, attacks on voting, on the rights to protest, you can see, and then you have a Prime Minister mm. who runs a coach and horses through the so-called good chaps uh, approach to government and the, the, the unwritten constitution. And you can see, you know, you think of a Donald Trump type character, you know, who was constrained by the American Constitution, a written constitution, constrained in some ways. Someone like that in 5, 10, 15 years, when the underpinnings of our democracy, mm. our media is under attack, you know, when all of those things are in place and someone like that comes along, who's watched what Boris Johnson has done, comes along and is far more concerted in what they do, you can see a very dark situation developing. So I think she's right to, to warn us about what potentially is happening. That's the, that's the price of democracy, isn't it? Constant vigilance. Did it grab your attention? 
Well, look, I think, to be honest, <clears throat> she's talking nonsense. And I think Clive put his finger on it when, I, when he said it was about getting people to look at her speech. Uh, by contrast, what the government's actually doing is supporting a liberal, democratic government of a country like Ukraine. And we're actually helping them stand up against an autocratic dictator uh, like Vladimir Putin. That's what we're actually doing. We're actually defending liberal democracy against violent thugs who would bring it to an end. You weren't with happy tanks to take and his guns. thugs' that's, money for many years, weren't no, you? No, I'm sorry. Party. Look, that's what we're doing. No, we didn't take his money. Well, you, you, to <laughs> donate to a <laughs> British political you party, you've got to be a British citizen or a British company trading in the United Kingdom. And we've always followed the law on that. But what we're actually doing, look at what we're actually doing. We're standing up for democracy, for people fighting against autocratic regimes, um, uh, against Putin's regime. That's what this government's and actually do doing. And I mean, what <clears throat> she's talking, I'm afraid, is nonsense. This, this, this and it's when you <clears throat> run out of good arguments that you start using extreme words. And I think in the House of Commons, oh. we should use moderate, reasonable language ah. when we're having our... What's do you, do you moderate and reasonable about sending people to Rwanda, an autocratic, despotic country in the middle of Africa, women and children who are seeking sanctuary. What's liberal and democratic about that, Mark? Well, your, your, dis your description about Rwanda is not one well, that the, the government agrees with. Well, We've well, set I'm out sure a perfectly it reasonable approach. What we're trying to do is break the business model of awful people smugglers who have no care for human beings. Because you've closed see them, down well, every on, other legitimate dangerous, avenue for people who, who to come see them safely making to this country. Dangerous what? journeys. All right in which lives are lost. Let's that's get, what we're Let's get to back to with. whether the word fascism was appropriate um, to use in the House of Commons in this way. Helen. I mean, no. As Clive said, it doesn't necessarily meet the definition. You know, we are not ruled by a dictator and we do still have a free media in this country. But I think what she did really powerfully was call out the way in which this government puts different values on different people's lives according to which war they're fleeing from. And I agree with Clive, the Rwanda, the Rwanda plan, it's shameful, it's cruel, it's designed to appeal to the basest of instincts in society. And I think the fact that it's been applauded by the right-wing media um, exposes the kind of inherent racism um, in, in certain parts of the media because they're able to welcome Ukrainian refugees, but not those who are fleeing a war in Afghanistan or, or the Middle East. So I, I do think that she made some really important points, but yeah, it's, we're not living under a fascist regime yet. You know? Well, I mean, I do worry about the kind of Twitterfication of politics and media, where actually we trade in kind of reactionary viral moments rather than the kind of substantive arguments that are being had. I do think that actually when she used the word fascism, she detracted, distracted from many of the arguments that you're putting forward when she was also mentioning the Rwanda plan. And I'd actually agree with you that I do think it is very morally questionable to effectively contract our immigration policy to developing countries in Africa rather than actually creating safe and legal routes, perhaps a humanitarian visa and so on. But that's not often what happens when we have these kinds of conversations, when we uh, use use language like fascism. The reality is Boris Johnson, uh, whether people like him or not, is democratically elected with an 80-seat majority, one of the uh, you know, best vote votes that the Conservative Party did uh, you know, in several decades. And I do think that actually critics of Boris Johnson would be better to actually try and understand people's concerns, why they voted for an individual like Boris Johnson, rather than bandying around <coughs> fascism. So we hear it, Nazi, fascist, so when we're actually in a context right now, as Mark rightfully mentioned, when we have you know, a brutal dictator to effectively waging uh, unjustified war of aggression um, in Eastern Europe. I think that we should be much more cautious then in using or, or watering down language like Nazi, like fascism, what we hear so So often. I think, you know, look, in terms of Boris Johnson's uh, you know, the, the, the vote and the, and the outcome of that, I mean, yes, he, he won that election under a voting system that's only used in Belarus elsewhere, first past the post. But the point is, it's only the place in the world that uses the first past the post is Belarus. I mean, that's a fact. We can debate that. But the United States of America. But that's not first past the post. But the point is, it's an electoral college system. No, it's an electoral college system. Well, it's president. Anyway, let's not get back to whether... But the point here about Boris Johnson is, like, I don't think Boris Johnson puts on a pair of jack boots in the morning. Clearly, I don't. But if you look through history, you, what you can see is that some there are various motivations. The road to head is paved with various motivations, and Boris Johnson is someone who is dying desperately to stay in power, and he is doing so much damage 
to this country, so right. much damage to the infrastructure of our democracy to hold on to that power. And that's the problem here, what he is potentially opening us oh, up to. I'm going to just interrupt before we go because we have this BBC breaking news. Energy price cap in UK expected to rise to £2,800 in October. That's at the very upper end of what people were worried about. That's up by more than £800, warns the regulator. We'll be talking about that tomorrow. Bye-bye.